Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, this is video number two in my series on um, prosopopopoeia. Now, if you didn't watch the first video, I urge you to watch that so you understand the, the foundation that was laid on this subject. Now, I'm going to better define what prosopopopoeia is and the technique of diatribe, but first let me reference again my, my playlist, James and Paul Shocking Facts. I came to a conclusion about the book of James uh, a couple of years ago that the, the way that we all rationalize the uh, seeming contradictions in James about works being needed, works being required, we all have our ways of trying to explain it and make it all fit and make sense. But uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I realized and came to the conclusion that uh, all of those explanations that we've all used uh, are really, it's like forcing a square peg into a round hole. It's really not the right way to understand the book of James. I believe that James did not agree with Paul. And uh, I think James was uh, teaching the way the church was in the very beginning, as I referenced in the first video in this series, that they didn't understand that uh, uh, works, religious work, practicing Judaism, they didn't know in the beginning that that had to be discarded. They, they thought in the beginning that it was practice Judaism and believe in Jesus. Uh, and so I, I have one of my videos on the playlist, uh, James and Paul, Shocking Facts. I put together a, a contrived conversation or argument. I think it's titled Argument Between James and Paul. Uh, and what I did was I took uh, verses that Paul has said uh, about faith alone and verses that James has said about faith and works being uh, required. And I fashioned them together, and uh, I, I spoke like I'm Paul saying that it's faith alone. And James said, no, it's faith and works. And I played out a little uh, play that I invented to, to illustrate that argument. Uh, unbeknownst to me, though, what I was actually doing was prosopopopia, and that is uh, playing it, pretending that I'm having a debate with someone that's not there. But, but speaking for them. And so uh, I did that not realizing that this is a technique. Uh, this is a oratory technique, and it's ancient. Uh, now the question is, did Paul use this technique in any of his letters? Now there's a um, um, uh, Richard Lundquist, no, L Richard Nordquist uh, said the, the following. I don't know who Richard Nordquist is, but he's defining these terms. He says, an apostrophe is a figure of speech in which some absent or non-existent person or thing is addressed as if present and capable of understanding. So in this case, this uh, Richard Nordquist is using the term apostrophe and also the term figure of speech uh, to, uh, rather than using the word prosopopopoeia. But it's this, the same idea, and let me repeat that. Uh, uh, it's a figure of speech in which some absent or non-existent person or thing is addressed as if present and capable of understanding. Uh, he goes on to say that in classical rhetoric, prosopopopoeia was one of the exercises used in the training of future orators. Prosopopopoeia allows its users to adopt the voices of others. So that's kind of what I did in my video about James and Paul. Uh, I was speaking as though I was Paul and then I was speaking as James going back and forth. Uh, I was kind of playing the, the out uh, acting out the part of two characters. Um, he, go, he goes on to write, in his important and massive book, The Deliverance of God, Douglas A. Campbell advances a controversial hypothesis 
about the epistle to the Romans that has Pauline scholars all astir. As far as I can tell, few have embraced the hypothesis, yet neither can they dismiss it uh, as without merit. Um, so he's saying that this idea that I'm presenting you today in this series uh, is causing a stir uh, among theologians, scholars, Pauline scholars in particular, I guess. And, and he says that it, it hasn't become widely accepted yet, but they can't really uh, come up with real good arguments against it. But this is for you to decide. As you watch this series, I'm hoping that uh, you will consider this. And if you think it's, uh, it turns out that you agree with it, let me know. And if you disagree, tell me. Tell me. Uh, I am not sure. And I, I would like to have your opinion on this. Uh, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. And I, I think it very well may be what Paul has done. But this... Uh, Richard Norquist goes on to write, uh, Campbell's proposal is this, Romans chapter 1 verses 18 through chapter 3 verse 20 is written as a diatribe. Now these words I've used here, diatribe, uh, figure of speech, apostrophe, prosopopopoeia, Basically, those all these are all different words to that uh, express the same concept. Um, by this term, Campbell does not mean a bitter and violent verbal attack. He refers rather to a Greco-Roman rhetorical device by which the speaker engages in a dialogue with imaginary interlocutors or opponents. This device was popular among uh, Cynic and Stoic rhetoricians and philosophers. Ancient diatribe is essentially a distinctive mode of discourse built largely with apostrophe and speech and character. The, the, these terms are all uh, interchangeable. A, a constructed character is generally addressed by the discourse's central protagonist, who is a broadly Socratic figure by means of the literary technique of apostrophe. So much of the discourse unfolds through the use of second person singular grammar. And that interlocutor uh, then responds, whether in brief or at length, through the literary technique of speech in character. So here the author puts words in his character's mouth. The result is a dramatic discourse mimicking the to and fro of debate and conversation, although slipping where necessary into more extended speeches by one or the other party. So, uh, Prosopopopoeia or diatribe or these other terms, uh, they all represent the idea that uh, if I was going to debate a subject and my opponent was not here, but I want to represent his ideas, I will give you my ideas and then I'll turn and give you his argument back, acting out his part too, pretending to be the opponent. Scholars have long recognized the presence of diatribal material in Paul's letters, such as Romans 3, uh, verses 1 through 9. But as we shall see, Campbell believes that the diatribal device is used far more extensively in Romans than heretofore believed. Uh, so, uh, he's saying that scholars have long recognized it. Paul uses this technique. Uh, however, now, they, now they're thinking that the um, prosopopopoeia is more extensive in Paul's letters than previously thought. And uh, if it is, turns out to be the case, then it really solves a lot of problems that we encounter 
with Paul's letters, particularly times where uh, Paul says things that seem to be completely out of character. I mean, Paul is the champion of uh, no works are required and, and grace and, and uh, free gift. And, and, and then when he comes out and seems to contradict himself, uh, this is what we'll get into as we go along in this study. But uh, it just seems like it never made sense to me. And, you know, we try to find some way of rationalizing it and, and uh, explaining it away so it doesn't seem like Paul is crazy or contradicting himself. Uh, but I think this prosopopoeia is a possible answer that, that really makes it all make sense. Uh, for example, he believes that Romans 1, verses 18 to 32, in fact, is spoken by the opponent whom Paul is seeking to refute. Uh, Campbell then goes on to remind us of something that we all already know, but probably have never thought much about, namely, Paul composed his letters with the expectation that they would be read aloud to the recipients. Uh, I'm assuming that some people are uh, novices in Bible study, and maybe you're just beginning to study the Bible. Uh, maybe you've studied it for, for years or decades, and, and yet maybe you're, you're not aware of this. But the fact is, when Paul had his letters sent, to the churches. Uh, they were not just mailed and delivered and, and anybody who grabbed the letter or the pastor of the church got the letter and read it to the church. No. A reader was sent with the letter. And the, the, the reader was sent so that he could read it as Paul wanted it read. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is well known and established as a, as a fact. So the question, of course, is why would it be necessary to have a reader? Why can't you just send a letter to the churches and let any a pastor, a church leader, or even any of the, the church members just get up and read the letter? Uh, Campbell then goes on to remind us of something that we all already know. Oh, I'm sorry, I read that. Uh, um, Think auditors, not readers. In other words, let's consider uh, the, the person that's reading, reading it as an auditor. Now, I'm not sure what he means by the word auditor, but we'll go on. It says, consider this for a second. If Romans was originally composed to be spoken, and if he composed part of it as diatribe, or prosopopopoeia, then he probably would have given the bearer of the letter Phoebe, for example, um, in Romans 16, verses 1 and 2, uh, probably would have given uh, the bearer of the letter sufficient instruction on how it was to be read. So if I was writing a letter and using this uh, technique, this oratory technique of prosopopopoeia or diatribe, and, and I wanted it read, I would want the reader to understand which parts are my opinion and which parts are the false teacher's opinions. And uh, you know, I'd have to make sure that it was uh, understood and rehearsed so that he could read it as I, uh, to make sure he's communicating that. Uh, the people themselves were largely illiterate. Their, quote, reading, unquote, was an experience of hearing the text. So most people at that time and place in history were illiterate. They couldn't read. They were relying on someone reading something to them. Paul's letters <coughs> were read out loud by someone, presumably the letter bearer, to an audience. They were performed. In this sense, each letter exists for us rather like the script of an old play. But a script that 
often preserves only one actor's lines, although an important one. Um, all the explicit stage directions, instructions from the playwright and director, not to mention the original coached performances, have been lost. So, in other words, we have Paul's letters, but any instructions and notes and directions he may have given to Phoebe or whoever is going to read the, the letter, we don't have any of that. Uh, and and w there would have been multiple performances. So when the letter is delivered, and you're going to read this as as Paul wants it read, as in a, as in a theatrical manner, uh, so that they understand you've got an argument between Paul and the false teacher, uh, they would not just go and read it one time, when maybe they'd read it they'd have several different performances of this. Romans, for example, probably involved repeated presentations to the small cells of Christians scattered through the suburbs of that large ancient city. A complete description of the preserved script's possible meanings. Then, uh, should take into account the broader range of effects that its full-blooded performance would have entailed within a communal setting. It was an unfolding play busy with drama, insinuation, color, plot, and movement. And like most plays, it probably had protagonists in some sort of conflict, whether in jest or in a more serious vein. In short, interpretation is best understood as the recovery of a set of performances by a letter bearer to an audience of listening Christians. So, to sum that up in my words, uh, Paul's writing uh, about his viewpoint compared to the false teacher. He presents his idea and he presents the, the argument coming back from the false teachers and he wants the letter read as though there's a debate going on between Paul and the false teacher. So, the letter reader would have to be aware of that and instructed by Paul of all of this so that he could, uh, he could perform this in a way that people understood that some of these things were not Paul's sayings, they were not Paul's views, but they were the views of the antagonist, the false teacher. I have never looked at the New Testament epistles in this light. This is the writer of the article. And yet, it's obvious. Um, it, it, it seems obvious to me, too. And as I said, I've only begun studying this over the last, really, I'd say, couple of months. Uh, and, and I haven't said anything publicly because it's new and I wanted to study it more before I even brought this to your attention. Uh, but now that I understand it, it, it really does seem obvious. and. As we go along in these video series, you'll, uh, I'm going to read this as I think Paul wanted it read, and it, it will seem obvious to you too, I think. Uh, if I have written a, a letter with the intention that it is to be read out loud to a group of people, I will be sure that the letter reader understands what I've written, and I will instruct him how to perform it properly and if I have employed the rhetorical device of diatribe in the letter, I will probably instruct him, for example, to alter the intonation and quality of his voice when he speaks in character, just so the audience cannot miss the dialogue between persons. And if I am parodying my opponent's position, then the change in voice actually becomes crucial. This is not something new for first century audiences. They have heard this kind of discourse many times before. Now, I, I don't think I've seen this in, uh, in, in modern times. Maybe it is used in some, maybe uh, in the theater, in, in, uh, in uh, movies or stories. I don't know. I don't, I'm not, haven't been familiar with it. But it's interesting that I 
invented it and used it unknowingly uh, when I did my uh, video on argument between Paul and James. I used this technique because I wanted to uh, present this argument between Paul and the false teacher, Paul and James. And uh, so uh, I did the same kind of a thing, not even being aware of this being an, uh, or, or an oratory uh, device. Uh, this possibility does not, of course, prove that Paul composed Romans 1, 18-32 as a speech spoken by the opponent whose views he is seeking to refute. But we at least have to entertain the possibility and determine whether Campbell's proposal offers a superior reading of the letter. Um, so that's the question. Uh, once we get to the point where I read this portion of the scriptures, uh, as I think Paul wanted it to be read, then you're going to have to evaluate it and see, uh, is this a, 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 a superior uh, reading of the letter? Is this, a, is this a, probably a better, more uh, accurate way to understand the intention of the letter? Uh, otherwise, we're left with some of these things uh, would be, Paul says this and then he says that. It's, it's, he's like he's arguing with himself. It never made sense to me. I don't know if, if you've ever noticed this. It seems like you must have noticed it if you've read um, all this before. It, it must have like struck you as odd. But this is the way that it makes sense. If Romans 1, 18 to chapter 3, verse 20, in fact, is a conversation between Paul and the teacher, what would it look like? So that's what I'm going to do in the, uh, the next video of the series. I think this next video will be the part three and the, the conclusion of this, the actual reading of it as Paul wanted it to be read. So thank you for watching. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.